Well, I'm excited uh, to finish up the series on the Ecclesia today, and today's message is entitled, A Fuller Understanding of the Way Forward. You'll recognize that most of the messages in the Ecclesia series was prefaced with the words, A Fuller Understanding. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, in just a little bit. But the way forward, uh, the subtitle is From Doing Church to Being the Ecclesia. So the Ecclesia is uh, a word that relates to a Greek word. Ecclesia is not an English word. It is a Greek word. And that Greek word is what is translated. How many of you know what that word is translated as in English? How many of you can tell me what it is right now? It is church. Ecclesia has been translated in the scriptures as church. How many of you know, after having been through this series, what the distinctive meaning of the word ecclesia is as compared what we normally think of with regard to church. How many of you feel you could confidently explain to me the difference between the ecclesia and the traditional understanding of church? Raise your hand real high if you could do that. Awkward. (laughs) Somehow I thought that might be the case. Ecclesia. It's really not a difficult thing. It's, uh, It's really pretty simple. In Matthew 16, the disciple Peter had come to Jesus. And Jesus asked him, he said, Who do the people say that I am? And Peter responded, and he said, well, some people say that you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Uh, Some say this or that, but Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And to that, he responds, well, you are the Christ which equals Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus then responds to to Peter and says, Blessed are you, Peter, because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but this has been revealed from heaven. Peter was getting a download from heaven as to who Jesus actually was. Because in truth, Jesus was not recognized for who he was. We think, well, Jesus, of course he's Christ. Of course he's the Messiah. But as much as they were looking for a Messiah, that was veiled and not understood. But that understanding that Christ is or rather that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, was revelational. It was revealed from heaven to Peter. And going beyond that, we see in the scriptures that he says, but upon this rock, what rock? The revelation of the knowledge of who Jesus is. I will build my ecclesia. Now it says church in your Bible, but the word is ecclesia. I will build my ecclesia. What is the ecclesia? Jesus took a Greek word with a Roman understanding because Israel was under the control of the Roman Empire at that time. 
Jerusalem was under Roman control. And so when Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, he was saying that based upon the reality of who I am, that knowledge will empower a people to be the people who will bring forth the knowledge of God's kingdom and bring it into the earth. That revelation is the revelation of the Ecclesia. Now, we don't think of the church very often in terms of having that kind of dramatic impact on the nations where the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. In our present world, we see all manner of evil rising up in these days. I mean, how many of you would believe, how many of you would have believed uh, 10 years ago that we would be where we are in relationship to the common acceptance of ideas related to LGBTQ, for example? There has been a landslide of shift in relationship to where we formerly had been as a nation that was really founded upon biblical principles. Amen? So the truth is that uh, the Ecclesia is God's answer for the plight of the nations. <laughs> you are God's answer. <laughs> so we've endeavored in this study to recognize that the Lord is not only building his house, but he's wanting his house to become the standard by which all the peoples of the earth go about their lives under the God of heaven and are therefore stewarding what God has given to all mankind over the earth. Amen? So Timothy, I've been, I've been really spending a lot of time personally in the books of Timothy, first and second, as well as Titus. Why? Because this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Apostle Timothy and giving him instructions. It's, in, it's interesting to me that uh, most seminaries will refer to uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus as pastoral uh, epistles or pastoral letters. In truth, they were actually apostolic letters to an apostle. Timothy was an apostle. And that's significant. Why? Because apostles understand what's needed to actually fulfill the commission. Pastors, as important as pastors are, and pastors are part of the Christ anointing, part of the five different anointings that make up the Christ anointing, pastors build the hearts of God's people to be people who believe the Lord and can follow apostolic strategic leadership. So apostles are very important. Timothy was an apostle. And Timothy was, uh, was blessed to have a mentoring relationship with the apostle among apostles, the Apostle Paul. And so Timothy uh, was receiving this letter from Paul, and in verse 1, uh, excuse me, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it says this. Paul is speaking to, to Timothy, and he says, If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves 
in God's household. What he was saying was, as the church gathers, the ecclesia, as the ecclesia gathers, it is God's household. Well, we're pretty accustomed to thinking of the church that way. The church is God's house. When we come into the church building, we think of it as the house of God. But the reality is that that house is only a place of gathering for the ecclesia, and the ecclesia's purpose is to be a people who are gathered under the fatherhood of God. But in the latter part of that same verse, you'll find that he speaks to another reality that is true, and that is he says uh, people ought to know how to conduct themselves in God's household and in the second part, which is the church of the living God. It is the ecclesia the called out ones, the called out ones. You know, we were singing this morning about being uh, freed from fear and recognizing I am a child of God. There's only two types of people in the world. You know, you're going to be told in our world that there's all kinds of different races, and different categories of mankind, but from a biblical and godly perspective, there's really only two. There's the children of God and those who do not yet have that relationship. And it is God's intention that the ecclesia would be the body of people the household of God, the church that is the pillar and the foundation of truth. Where else can you find truth except from the one who created all of mankind? The reality is we believe many things. We believe many things in our world. One of the things that's being you know, taught to us today is, well, you can't be certain that you're male or female. And, um, and in fact, it's really um, to our uh, great advantage if you become uh, a person who really reflects both genders. So that's what we call androgyny. Andro refers to the male, and uh, gynaco is the second root word that speaks of the female. And so it's really a combination of the male and the female. Uh, the world would like to see you become an androgynous being who then can describe what, uh, what gender you prefer based upon what you choose. But the scriptures tell us that the church is the pillar and the foundation of all truth. So it is what we have to hold on to so that in the midst of a world in which there is great uh, challenges to the traditions of understanding and knowledge that we've had, we can hold fast to that knowledge. It's so important. So. I want to emphasize, in this study, we've been emphasizing what has been really a much different understanding of what the church is called to be than what tradition has accepted and what tradition has taught really all of us. And so we've come into a place where we've tended to believe that the church was a place of refuge, a place of receiving teaching about God's ways, but the understanding that the church really has the empowerment to shift the nations is an idea that, frankly, 
sounds too big for us. We look at ourselves and we go, how can we possibly produce that kind of outcome? And yet that's exactly what God intends for his church to be. God intends that his church would be uh, completely uh, uh, filled with the purpose and the knowledge of the purpose, that our purpose is to see that the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God, fills the earth as the waters cover the sea. Right? That's what it says in Isaiah. Uh, so we know that God has an intention for his glory to manifest in the world. What is his glory? Jenny Mellon was giving the message uh, a, a couple of weeks back, and she wound up speaking that the Greek word for glory is doxa, and doxa means the thoughts, the understanding, the opinions of God. So the glory of God relates to the notion that he is the embodiment of all truth. So if you want to know truth in your life, then we have to align with what the scriptures teach us because those scriptures are inspired by God in order that we might come into the knowledge of the truth. And yes, the truth is a relationship with Jesus Christ, but it also brings a formation of our understanding to our minds. Amen? So God is, is interested in a cultural transformation of the nations. Do you believe that? So our study has really attempted to really honor and recognize that the more traditional understanding of church is not doesn't have it all wrong. Because in, in reality, the church is called to be a gathering of the called out ones. It is called to be a place where men and women are discipled in the knowledge of the truth. But it is equally also meant to be a medium by which the world would be transformed, having uh, received the knowledge of who God is because of a people who are walking in the fullest expression of who God is. You see, the, the scripture tells us that, uh, that Jesus is the fullness of the Father. He is the full expression of who the Father is. If Jesus is the full expression of who the Father is, and we are to become like Jesus, and it is our discipleship that allows us to become more and more transformed into his image, then our goal is that we can likewise become like Jesus those who together embody the fullness of who God is in the earth. That's what we're called to. That's, that's an exciting process. That's an exciting purpose and destiny. So our intention has been not to destroy the former model, and the truth is there's great value in the former model in discipling men and women and enabling men and women to be gathered to a place where relationships can be strengthened between ourselves and God and between ourselves. It is, uh, it is God's uh, full intention for that. But um, we have the beginnings of an appearing, of a knowledge that there's a greater purpose that we're called to than simply being a self-occupied um, group of individuals who are only concerned with our own well-being. 
In fact, we are called to bring about a, uh, a knowledge of the glory of God throughout the entire earth. Psalm 2 says this in verse 8, Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. The psalmist, when he wrote that, who was he speaking about? Anybody. <laughs> okay. Tom says us. How many of you think he was speaking about Jesus? He was speaking about Jesus. Absolutely. But, <laughs> who are we? Well, we saw in, in Timothy, we are the church of the living God. We are the body of the anointed one. So, as the body of the anointed one, would it be true to say that this verse, verse 8, is about us? What do you think? It absolutely is about us. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. So, God has always been concerned with the world. And the fall did not diminish his love for the world. Not a bit. The ecclesia is the body of Christ, of which Jesus is the head, and for which he gave himself. So Jesus gave himself for the purpose of raising up a body. But the church is the fruit of God's primary love for the world. That's actually what the church is. The church is, its purpose is to release God's love into all the world. I can't overemphasize the importance that this primary work is that we have as the ecclesia. So I want you should have a handout uh, with you uh, at this point, and I, I'm going to just uh, I'm just going to go over briefly these five paradigms that are on the front side of your handout. Because these five paradigms uh, are really different uh, models or different patterns of how transformation is going to take place in the world. Number one, the Great Commission is about discipling nations and not individuals. Not just individuals. We, we certainly recognize that... Uh, we have been called to uh, bring individuals into the knowledge of God, but we actually are called to bring the knowledge of God's thoughts, ideas, and opinions into the world. Now, I hear some people say, well, how can I as a believer force others to believe what I believe? You can't force them to believe what you but you can express the ideas, thoughts, and opinions of God. Why? Not because they're your opinions, thoughts, and ideas. Our ways are lower than his ways. His ways are higher than our ways. So when we have accepted his ways, then we have the ability to say that what we bring into the world is the knowledge of what God is wanting represented. It's up to the individuals to accept or deny. To accept or deny. Amen? The atonement secured redemption not only is for individuals, but it's also for the marketplace, which is the heart of the nation. So the atonement, 
That's a theological term. The atonement relates to the idea that God's forgiveness in the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. It is the means by which we receive our forgiveness. Our forgiveness comes because Jesus shed his blood so that by receiving him, by receiving his sacrifice, we receive his forgiveness and we walk in his righteousness. That's the atonement. The atonement secured redemption not only for individuals, but for the marketplace. That means in the marketplace, the ecclesia is to be active in bringing forth the ideas, the thoughts, and the opinions of God in the world. How about that? Number three, labor is worship. Let me, re let me repeat that. Let me underscore that. Labor, your work, is worship. And since all believers are ministers, does anyone question that? <laughs> you know, I remember when we first began to uh, minister, when, when we first, uh, Deborah and I first began to take leadership of the church, we had a real challenge with people accepting the idea that we are all ministers. But that's a really basic understanding. Christ, uh, the Apostle Paul said that uh, we've all been given the ministry of reconciliation. All of us are called to be reconciling the world unto Christ. So, uh, so we're all ministers, and labor is worship to turn our jobs as places of worship of God and ministry to others. I'm not saying that we're gonna that we're gonna do what we do here on Sunday mornings <laughs> at work. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the worship of God is is doing your work as unto the Lord. Can you imagine what our world would be like if all people did their work as unto the Lord? That alone would be transformational. It would absolutely change our world. Jesus is the one who builds his church. That's number four, not us. Our assignment is to use the keys of the kingdom to lock and unlock the gates of Hades because the entire world is what? Under the control of the evil one is what the scripture declares. If you're not in Christ, then by definition, you are under the control of the evil one. It, no matter what it looks like, no matter how righteous it may appear, our denial of Christ makes us antichrist. And antichrist is fueled by spirits of darkness. So it's either or. I know that there are many, you're going to tell me, I know, but, but Pastor Randy, I know some really wonderful people. I know some really wonderful people who do not know the Lord. And I say, yes, I do too. But the scripture is very clear. You're either on the one side or you're on the other. It's, it's really that simple. And, uh, you know, J Jesus spoke to that. He said, I've not come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. I've, I've come to bring a division. Uh, not because he wants to be divisive, but because he wants those who have received the truth to stand out as shining lights in a dark world so that the entire world can begin to recognize this is the true and authentic way to live. So number five, the elimination of systemic poverty in its four dimensions. Not just physical. 
It's spiritual, it's relational, it's motivational, and it's material. So the elimination of systemic poverty in its four dimensions. So how do we accomplish this? That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? <laughs> well, first of all, we need to realize that we're no greater than Jesus, and this is what Jesus said. In John 5, verse 30, it says, I can do nothing on my own. Now, please understand what he said, because you will tell me you can do plenty of things. I can do plenty of things. <laughs> yes, we can. But Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Now, I say that not to bring condemnation on you because I know that just like, just like you, I am not living there. I don't live with that kind of intentionality and that kind of focus. Wish to God that I were. But it is a reality that God intends that we become progressively more and more dependent upon living our lives based entirely upon what he is speaking and what he is saying. Amen? So how are we going to accomplish these uh, five models or these five paradigms? Uh, in the book, uh, it uses, on the back side of your uh, handout, there is uh, the four different uh, ways that uh, are steps that constitute the model that uh, Dr. Silvoso uh, detailed in his book, and he gets that, as uh, Rob spoke about last week, he gets that out of the scripture, and that is that when you go into a home, you bless it, you bring peace upon the home, and so you're blessing uh, individuals. Then you're establishing uh, fellowship with individuals, and in the means of doing that, you're listening to find out what it is that is a need in their lives. And then it's about ministry to that, recognizing that uh, there are things that God has as a solution for their problem, and you want to help connect man's need with God's provision. And then finally is to declare, and that is simply to declare that the kingdom of God has come, it's come near, and I confirm that the power and presence of God is in the neighborhood. So we've got, uh, we've got a solution right here. So this is, this is the uh, prayer evangelism that we'll explore even more in the days to come, but uh, this is uh, really uh, the way that we go about connecting with people in real life. It's not just handing them a track and, and, and telling them uh, all have sinned and uh, fall short of the glory of God. Though that's true, uh, people need connection. And this is a model of how connection can take place. How is this achieved? It's done prayerfully as you look to engage with people. So a principle of this book has been that if we attempt to achieve uh, a radical change in the ecclesia to become uh, the ecclesia that uh, uh, we, uh, we've seen in this study. What we have to realize is that only about 5% of the people really get it. That's why there were so few people who really understood what ecclesia meant from the very beginning, because we have a tendency to just want to live out of the flow of what has been, and the idea of shifting into something that is different than what uh, the church has been seems to be a daunting proposition. Uh, 
Ed Silvoso in his book says that there's roughly 15% who will become implementers. They'll catch the vision from the other 5% that we spoke about. And so roughly 20% will begin to go after this, but 80% of the church will not. And what he said was, be careful not to, uh, not to uh, come against that segment. Because that 80%, they are the maintainers. And they are those who will be the late adopters. But that's okay, because that's the way God has fashioned them. So I'll be honest with you. Um, I had to learn that lesson because, I'll be honest with you, I want everybody to be in the class of visionaries. God, forgive me. It's not how his church is going to be built. His church is going to be built much more simply. So the book and the study that we've been into has been recognizing that uh, we have to go about this with wisdom, and uh, we have to recognize that we're coming against the headwinds of culture. So, you know, when you're, when you're sailing and you have to go to a destination that is right where the headwinds are coming from, how are you going to get there? There's three things I want to leave you with, and this is one of them. This is the first one. Number one, it's actually not, not there yet, um, but that's all right. So first, think about a, sa a, a sailing vessel. Now, if you're going to sail somewhere and you're sailing into headwinds, how are you going to get to your destination? <laughs> you can't sail into the headwinds. In fact, uh, it said that uh, between roughly 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, that arc of space, as far as where the wind is coming from, there is no way in physics a sailboat can proceed towards a destination that is in that, in that arc. So what you have to do instead is you have to zigzag. You have to tack. You've heard that word? Tack. So you have to tack one way, and then you, so you go at roughly 45 degrees, and then you come about. Some of you may know that terminology, come about. It's so that the, the sails go to the opposite side, and you're tacking back at a 45 degree angle to go the other direction, and you're tacking back and forth. Now, tack is actually the root word from which we get the word Tactics. Tactics. So tactics are, are how you get to the destination that you're going to. So Jesus has given us the strategy. The strategy is, I want the body of Christ to get ever bigger and to be ever more influential so that all people in the world come to know the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord that I have given my life so that they might have life and life more abundantly. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of him. That's God's desire. That is what he desperately wants. So how are we going to get there? We're going to tack back and forth. Okay? So we're going to go in a direction that is going to change from time to time. And that changing in direction is at his direction because Jesus is the head of the church and he knows when we need to tack, when we need to come about, and when we need to shift and change. Amen? Number two, one of the keys to breakthrough is to stop viewing our problem as bigger than what our solution is that God has for us. So, you know, we have a tendency to go, Man, you don't know how big my problem is. You don't know how, you just don't know how big my problem is. And the more we magnify the problem, 
the more difficult it is for you to ever develop faith to believe that God could actually change that. And that's true in any area of your life. Uh, uh, No one can do anything if they believe they cannot. It's just just the way things are. Henry Ford is uh, uh, attributed with this quote, and that is, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So how can we inform our own minds with the truth of what God has said about us? God has said, I've given everything that you need for life and for godliness. And yet we say, I can't do it. It's not possible. I'm too weak. I'm incapable of of achieving that. But God says, no, you are capable, and I will fulfill it. And finally, the third point that I would make is that if we're going to actually achieve this, it means we have to learn godliness in our relationships. Our relationships is what will empower us to be the people that God is calling us to be. That's why we are called to be the called out ones. So I I wish Deborah uh, could be here to share with you. She's going to share uh, at the end of the year the information that she was going to share today. But it's so fitting along these lines because the reality is that the attack of COVID on our lives has been so significant in producing uh, a uh, a fear in mankind, and she had she had some statistics on that. She's been dealing with this prophetically uh, ever since the very beginning of COVID. Just saying, we are not as a people responding well to this. We are not responding well, and and the impact that this has had on our culture and yea, even in the church, has been dramatic, has been dramatic. So we have to learn uh, relationship, and we have to learn godliness. So uh, it is uh, a fundamental, and and Rob had referred to this earlier, that he said, you know, pastor will probably make mention of this. We're going to be leaning in in uh, the beginning of the year into some basic messages that relate to what it means to be people of the word, what it means to be people of the kingdom, what it means to be people who walk in the character of Christ. Because um, these understandings of the ecclesia, as great as they are, it won't, it won't suffice unless we understand how to move forward in our own lives. You can go ahead and put up that last graphic, and if you'd like, you can look at the back side and that final graphic that we have there, and it says, our pathway for transformation to fulfill the Great Commission really begins, first of all, with you and with me. It begins with renewing our heart. It begins with renewing our minds, getting our minds in line with what the Scripture teaches. And then to strengthen your home. Yes, your home. To be a priest in your home. To make sure that the way that your children are being uh, uh, informed and uh, and affected are really um, based upon God. And then from that strength that comes from your own heart and from the heart of a strong uh, family, Uh, built on Christ is the ability to go out and to really have impact in our world, to be light and salt in the world. Amen? So this is the message of this series. It is a significant challenge, and some of us have captured this notion of the ecclesia being something that goes beyond 
what we've seen being expressed, and we want to walk in it. Amen? Uh, some of us more than others, frankly, but uh, all of us who are mature would think likewise because it's really consistent with what the Bible teaches us that we are to become. So, um, so we're called into that. So uh, in light of this moment and having really had impartation significantly in this series, we've had some tremendous teachings. I would encourage you to revisit those as the Lord would prompt you. Look at that YouTube channel. Go back and re-listen to some of those messages that you may be drawn to by the power of the Spirit and hear them again.